Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the Ramos Law Difference Makers podcast, where I, your host, Dr. Jim Hoven, have the chance to meet with incredible people doing incredible things and making a difference. Today, I have the honor of having an Olympic, uh, Olympic doctor, we're going to call him, Dr. Eric St. Pierre with me. He has uh, worked with Olympic athletes, continues to do so, and has an incredible story that we're going to share today. So uh, this is one that you're going to want to listen to. You're going to want to enjoy, sit back. You're going to learn a lot about the Olympic experience, a lot about training, and this is going to be a killer, killer show. So without further ado, Dr. Eric St. Pierre, thanks for coming to the show, my friend. Yeah, man. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Absolutely. We've known yeah. each other for a bit now, and it's we've been uh, I've been excited for a day like this to come, and I know that your background, I've been to your office a couple of times and yep. seen what you've done. Would you please share with our audience how you got into chiropractic specifically and then pass that into sports medicine? Like, were you always an athletic young guy growing up or how did all that transpire? Yeah, I grew up playing sports from the East Coast, um, Massachusetts, played everything. But at 17, I broke my femur playing ice hockey. Oh, with six seconds left in a game. I went knee first into the boards, broke my femur. That got me into the idea of sports medicine. Really wasn't sure what I was going to do in college. Thought, you know, at that point you think you're going to play sports your whole life. But um, sports kind of just dominates the area. Played every sport. My dad had fallen on my skateboard years before and had gone to a Cairo. So, and who who helped him, you know. And, and he had always kind of put that in my mind. And then in high school... They kind of evaluate your personality and, and your interest in one of the thing, one of the two professions. I don't even remember the other one. Was <laughs> block chi- that one out? Chiropractic, and um, because healthcare was changing, and and you want to be active. Um, medicine's changing. People are looking to take care of themselves. So when I got hurt, I knew I liked sports med. Um, it was either going to be like athletic training, physical therapy, but my dad kept chirping in my ear about chiropractic and and. In undergrad, I, I did some rotations and worked in, a, in an integrative facility as an intern, as a young guy. And um, the gentleman just pushed me into it, you know. Well, you so could, you'd never been adjusted, per se, prior to no, going to school? No, my, my, I guess my dad had, but um, I went and did a rotation and I was sick one day, like destroyed sick and had to go home. But he's like, let me adjust you first. And it, like he had tissues ready, like my everything drained and um but it was an integrated facility but he he was still adjusting people manipulating them and i i, I decided to go i focus on sports med and um in undergrad sports science movement science and then moved to florida and worked for a, a big physical therapy group and 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 even they were telling me if you want to be an entrepreneur own your own business not just do therapy then maybe consider this profession chiropractic so Wow. Yeah. And, and so at the time you're going through all these things, you already had a pretty deep connection to sports, not only through you playing, but the rotations that you had done and your undergrad. So chiropractic sounds like the way you're going to try it. When you got to school, what did you find the chiropractic experience? Because you and I share this, right? We're both DCs. Yeah. And um, I, my story is a little bit different where I got hurt playing football. So it, like you broke something my neck got twisted up in making a really poor tackle on my part sure. and I ended up and, and then f- following that I rolled a, a vehicle and so those combination things that wound me up there so you know I knew what I wanted to do from junior and high school right so yeah, I get yeah. in there but the, the experience was way different than I thought like when I got there I'm like oh am I going to start learning to adjust people right away and how sure. does it work was it when you were in school did you see the athlete and the sports side pretty quickly and how it was going to work or did you have to wait to start getting some of that because you had so much sports background before yeah well i moved to florida after my undergrad with friends in fort lauderdale boca raton area and worked in a sports performance place as a physical therapy assistant it wasn't a, a certified position but i was their assistant and then chose a chiropractic school in los angeles that just had the west coast was a little different there was a everyone was so active wellness um nutrition it, it just seemed to be part of the culture more and so I knew I'd probably be working with athletes and active people, wellness, health. So um, I chose a school in Los Angeles. And, and so I had an idea like you, like I, I, I did know kind of what I wanted to do. It's just the profession kind of like aligned with what I wanted. And the school I went to just ended up having a sports medicine residency that started while, when I was finishing my undergrad. So I jumped, so into, a, a, yes. I, I jumped into a residency program 
And the director's father had been deep as a chiropractor in developing a lot of the profession's training for um, a sports medicine specialty. And his son, my, the director, um, was kind of a generation that had gone to the Olympics as a chiropractor. And then they were starting a residency. So after my, my chiropractic degree, I did a, a sports medicine residency for chiropractic, which was rare. I think I was the second one. About two, three months into that residency, it was a three-year commitment, which, you know, our profession, it didn't really, there was neurology and right. radio. I thought I would do radiology yeah, because I, I worked the whole time in Cairo in the radiology department. So reading films and, but it ended up after three months or so, he resigned and he became the um, U.S. Olympic Committee's medical director because they were changing their model, um, at least how I perceived it from away from a, a traditional allopathic type model to, you know, healing and, and strategies, therapeutic like interventions that are conservative, but with a deep diagnostic ability. The residency was built for that. They allowed me to travel and I started traveling with like five, six teams as a, um, you know, as a trainer, as whatever. Now, were you, know? you in, in your chiropractic school still at yep, that time? Yep, it was, it was still at the school I had gone to. And um, a lot of the mentors had, they work with professional sports. So, you know, every month I was at that school from the traditional chiropractic to the residency. It was just, you could see this alignment with, if you want to work with athletes, the whole industry, whether it's personal industry, uh, personal I injury or sports medicine is changing. People want results. So um, I was set up really well to offer the services they needed. That's incredible. So um, by chance, this yeah. is like just a, a possible connection we might have, I don't know. Because you trained out in LA, did you ever run across Dr. Tim Brown by chance? Yeah, of course. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. He was all around our school. He's a surfer guy. You know yes, him pretty well? I, yes, I do. He's a friend of mine and his connection to, for those listening, uh, Dr. Brown is as chilled out and laid back a cat as you'll ever meet, but he's really smart. His resume and his vitae is insane. It's like, seems like it's 110 pages long, right? All the stuff he's yeah. done, but yeah. he was famous for bringing the tape that you see to America. So you see this tape on everybody's bodies. If you're in the audience, you, you know, right? Like if you're watching the Olympics or you're looking at athletes in any sport, they all have this tape on them. Well, Dr. Brown had taken that and he was first trying to treat his athletes, especially the swimmers and the volleyball players with, with wetsuits, with neoprene and wetsuits. And he saw this tape that Kenzo Case had made. Exactly, in yep, Japan. In yeah. Japan, and yep. then he asked him, he told me that he asked him if he could, if he would mind, cause he's so chilled out, right? He didn't want to take anything. So he asked Dr. Case, hey, um, I think I have another application. Would you be okay? Cause it was for lymphatic edema and that kind of stuff. So he brings it back and, and ends up applying it to these athletes and it starts doing so well. And so he really innovated and revolutionized that whole game here. So the fact that you've had a chance to hang out with him, super cool, yeah, great guy. Their whole kind of crew, that, that generation, I mean, they just broke through and, and it was all about results. And he's developed postural shirts from yes. there. I'm sure he's doing a ton of other stuff, but um, yeah, that was our community. Those are the people kind of we were watching and um, I didn't been around him a bunch, but uh, other people I was closer to and, and, and they, it was just a next generation of a sports science in our profession that, um, we got the, I got the best education, you know, they set the table for us and then I got to, you know, have opportunities that, um, they really helped forge. Yeah. He's one of the, there's a group of them that are just excellent rock yeah. stars. Yeah. Well, how yeah. did this transition then for you to have an, an opportunity to work in the Olympics or with the Olympic teams? Did it start out through this residency? Is that kind of where it funneled into yeah. or is that a different Dr. Connection? Michael Reed, he's, um, he worked with the American chiropractic board of sports physicians. Um, he became the medical director and I got a lot of opportunities to travel because my residency, you know, I, I risked a lot. It's much more stable now. You there's whether it's how much you're paid or I hope they can defer their loans at this point. Cause I couldn't, I had to take a risk, but he had been to the game. So I identified it because of that. When I was done, I did, I, I did two years and I moved out to Colorado thinking I could get a position at the United States Olympic committee kind of fell through um, where there's an option to come back to San Diego to work as a, a trainer and probably hopefully be there for a long time. But I had already relocated to Colorado and 
opened where we are now in 2009. It already existed, but I, I joined. And within a few months, four or five months after that, U.S. Speed Skating knew I worked with bobsled, skeleton, water polo, did some AVP beach volleyball with those guys. Um, you know, uh, weightlifting, USA weightlifting was my first one. And, um, and they invited me to come and they were like, we don't have a trainer for whatever reason. And we have about four weeks before the Olympic trials. We're about four months out from the Olympic games. You're a hybrid background. I was going, I, I have a nursing degree. I was going to nursing just to have a deeper, deeper medical background. Yes. And, uh, so physician, medical, Cairo, conservative, everyone, I align with everyone. So they, they said, we want you to be the head trainer at that point. No Cairo from what I understand had ever gone to the games as a head trainer. It's nice to go and be a part of the team, but to kind of own it. So I work with a medical director, Eric Hayden, who, um, yes. Famous Speed skater. Yeah, right? So, yeah. So he's ends up, he's an orthopedic surgeon. We, we interviewed him on my podcast like a few mo- or a month ago. And, um, and I got to be the head trainer at uh, two Olympics, but that first one was Vancouver and we went, and everyone on the team won an Olympic medal. Well, that was the first time ever for, for the U.S. speed skating or the short track team. Wow. And it just uh, kind of expanded from there. But how many people said that residency will probably just go into practice? Uh, you don't need to do it. No one does that. And I was like, but I could see an opportunity um, not only to grow, but to uh, do things I want to do. And I don't, whether it's an athlete or an active person or someone just who suffered trauma, I I dig like the physiology and teasing. So cool. So explain to the audience, what role does a chiropractor play? Because there's a lot of people that have seen us as a chiro for their back pain or their neck pain or whatever, but there's a lot that haven't. So if someone's never been exposed to chiropractic or chiropractic at the performance level to help you get the most out of it, what does a chiropractor do in that sense with the athletes? And how does it interrelate to the other um, healthcare opportunities that these athletes have so with with athletes specific, historically people know chiropractic as doing adjustments manipulation um there's wellness principles i went to a very medically based school so if anything we got somewhat criticized that it was like you're trying to become a physician but you can't prescribe and manage that way i'm like well we have the scope to manage most anything but as a chiropractor we have the ability to actually work with you, touch your body, and whether it's um, movement or treatment, um, the chiropractor's perfectly set up. Usually if you have training in like sports, some sports performance, whether it's personal trainer or strength and conditioning or athletic training, you could actually support the, the athlete really well. And most of the injuries that you're dealing with are either soft tissue or structural like spine stuff that are not surgical and don't need significant medical intervention so whether it's a athlete or an accident like most of it can be managed by a conservative provider a chiropractor yeah Um, that's awesome yeah and and were they were the athletes receptive i'm going to tell you a quick story yeah before that reminds me of this so like you way way back i would treat the avp players which is the association of volleyball professionals for those listening when they would come to, to denver Interestingly enough, though, so this is when they did the, I did the beach tour, right? And yeah. so when they would come out uh, to Boulder Res, I would do those guys. And then when the fours would come, I would do the fours. And so they would come out and all of them would allow me to do muscle work on them and stretching. None would allow me to adjust them because they all went to Dr. Tim Brown. Yeah. Right. I'm That's sure. who they all saw because yeah. they were all from California. So they would all see him for their, their care. So anyway, I got used to how these athletes worked and what they were about and, you know, doing it several times, really enjoyed it. And they would have these like, um, bread, these, um, bowls with power bars in it and Gatorade. And, you know, they were trying to watch their diet and these, these athletes were ripped. This was back when Karch Karai was playing sure. versus coaching and Randy Stoklos and all these guys. Right. So those yeah. were the, the generation that I got to work on. Well, then the next year following my last AVP tour year, I was asked if I would do, because um, going through the same program that Diplomate in Sports, yeah. going through that program, we had access to all the events coming in. So I was asked to work an event in Vail that was the Pro Mogul Tour. Okay. And so it was like, so cool, man. We're up in Vail and these yeah. athletes. And what they did there is they would they would have, and they still do it this way, I think. They would have 
heat, uh, you know, heat, head to head heats. Yeah. And then you have to come down for form and style of two jumps and then the time they combine it and do your deal. And so we were watching and interestingly enough in their player tent, that stuff that we were doing, just like what you do, you know, with muscle work and taping, it was all so new to them because they were kind of a cast off rebel type of sport at that time. Volleyball sure. was more, you know, volleyball wasn't football by any means, more but mainstream. It, was, it was more mainstream yeah. than were these guys. So these guys had in their tent, the stuff we were doing, they were amazing. They're like, dude, bro, I never seen anything like this. Holy cow, right? <laughs> and we're just having tons of fun. In their tent, they had um, bread bowls of stew and Patron tequila. That's oh. what they serve their athletes. Oh, so man. quite different from the AVP folks. Well, how that plays into the story was as we were, we were at Midvale and, you know, I'm treating all the guys and, and they're doing their thing. And all of a sudden, you know, we look up and there was a dude that was up at the top of the run and he did not have a paired partner. And he starts coming down and the place was packed. Imagine Midvale just packed with people. The guy's coming down and he's going through the bumps and going through the bumps and he just looks different. He looks different. And we're all looking and all of a sudden he's like, <gasps> Oh, and the rumbling starts coming. The dude is naked. Oh. Straight oh. naked. Jeez. He goes down, hits the first jump, and does a daffy. I can't remember if he did a daffy or spread eagle. He does one of them. He comes down, hits the second jump, and he completely, <laughs> completely wipes out. I mean, yard sale. But he had nothing to yard sale but his skis because he was naked. He was naked. The, cloud, the crowd, as you can imagine, goes insane. Out from the trees comes a guy to give him like a jumpsuit. Well, the guy puts on the suit, everybody's going nuts. It turns out the guy got liquored up on the Patron tequila oh. in the tent, but he had been eliminated in one of the earlier heats. Oh, wow. He was a pro. Oh, wow. So that ended up wow. costing him his season the next oh, year because wow. he got kicked off oh, the geez. tour. They so, probably didn't have tequila the next no, year. No, no, yeah. no more tequila there in, yeah. in the tent. So anyway, um, those kind of stories are priceless for me as when I was doing that kind of work as my primary thing. With, with you were going through, how did the athletes... Um, treat their their body with respect to the amount of rest they get the amount of their, their diets do you notice that it was cleaner or are they so young that they're just still like oh, i'll eat anything what's the current climate of how these elite level athletes take care of themselves outside of their training time yeah i mean it's their job at this point um even speed skating it's kind of an obscure sport to the country but um a lot of them come from an inline background so right now i work the elite level i work primarily just helping us speed skating out a little bit. Um, but they take care of their bodies. They're educated. They have nutritionists. They, they even have sports psychologists, their coaches are ex athletes. So they might not have a perfect diet, but it is pretty good compared to the average person. Um, as they age, as they mature, they're going to educate themselves and they have a trainer usually there helping guide them, but every athlete has to find what works for them. And even though tequila at a race might not make any sense, it probably helped a bunch of them to relax and, uh, and perform better. But, um, yeah, most of them do well, uh, they, for, for short track speed skating, it is fairly young, but all the sports, the seven NGBs I work with, or even like the LG games, I work with motocross and Disney wire world of sports. Like most of the athletes take it seriously. But, um, if you're trying to squeak out a little bit more performance, in, in their aging, they'll dial in their diet more and more, especially the older athlete in, in elite sport, 28, 30 is old or yes. older. So you gotta, you have to start like figuring it out quick. But, um, I think most of them are pretty committed to their diet and there's more information now. And, and it, it's nice. Cause, um, you know, I try to avoid gluten as much as possible, but I'm not completely free. We manage mostly a vegetable diet. Um, obviously alcohol should be limited if you're trying to perform and there's other modifications that we can appreciate like lifestyle and most of them do a great job. Oh, that's yeah. amazing. Yeah. Have you found, actually share with us, cause I've never been, what's it like to be at an Olympics? What's the village like? What's the experience like? And I don't know if you were able to be part of the opening or closing ceremonies, like yeah. walk us through that from the inside because very, very few people ever have been able to participate at that level. Yeah, I think at both games I went to, only 50 medical personnel represented Team USA. So if you're a hybrid or you've worked with other teams, you're valued. And that's not why I was chose. I was with US Speed Skating, but I had worked with so many winter sports where you're in a bubble, whether it's COVID or not, you're in a bubble. You're not allowed to leave. The US building is one of the few buildings that doesn't have flags on it because you are a target. 
So it's a weird world. Towards the end, you'll see a U.S. flag on our building, but the other countries, Italy, whatever, China, Austria, everyone knows their building, but you go in, it's a community. You have full access. You're eating in one like hall, but USA staying in a building. We're a big country, so we get our own building generally. And um, the training room is essentially, these are high-end condos that will be sold after the games. This is how it usually plays out. So you're in this unfinished condo where, say, the, the island might be done in the kitchen, but they've boxed it in. So it's a stripped-down condo. Okay. And so it's a hotel condo type thing, and everyone has their rooms. And um, y the medical might be in a big living room of the nicest condo or a big, big room. Yeah. And you'd be really in a bedroom is where the medical director is or the, the USA staff is organized. And it's it's pretty interesting, but you walk around and you're around all, you know, when I went to the two games that, you know, the NHL players were there and I grew up playing ice hockey, that was my primary sport. And so like meeting, you know, people you, you're very familiar with yes. and them being as excited to, you know, the, especially in skating sports, like, do you know this coach? Do you know? And it's like, no, I don't, but I want to talk to you about you. Yeah. You play for my team, you know? So, uh, it's pretty neat. And you eat in the hall and you're sitting next to them and, and you're one. But it, it's more of a, a world community. People, there's rivalries, but it's um, everyone's nice and happy, you know, to be Do you there. notice that a lot of the, if someone is competing, let's just say, since we just had the Winter Olympics, let's say the, the Alpine skiers. Would the Alpine skiers that are competing against each other, are they in their zones and they're not really doing much till their race is over? And then after their race is over, hey, man, we're all hanging out together because we know each other from being on the World Cup or doing all that kind of stuff. Do they do that or do they? Yeah, how does no, that all the countries are the, they're all friends or relative. I mean, they travel as a, as, a, as one segment. And often, you know, the some of the national governing bodies don't have enough money. So the, all the countries get together and rent out a hotel. So they know them and they grow up with them. Wow. When I say you're a high, a high level, you're on a national team, you're going to probably be 16, 17, really getting deep into that up till 25. You know these people. And, and the coaches often are from other countries. They move around. So that you, you like I, we had Korean coaches and then we had Canadian coaches and, and, and they have friends and essentially their family. So it's all one community. So, um, there are two villages. You have the village down for the winter games are much smaller than the summer games. But yes. the difference is, is the winter games are literally in a town, in a, in a community. So like we, I live in Lafayette near Boulder and think of like, if it was in Boulder, it would be the skiing events would be up in Netherlands. Right. So there's another village up there, but when they're done, they get, you get to leave normal times. You get to leave the village, go explore. And, and, you know, the medical team doesn't get a lot of time to go out, but you might go to another event. But, uh, I didn't get to go to opening ceremonies cause we have injuries and people are competing the next day. Right. But, uh, closing ceremonies, I got to go and, and that was great. You get to wear your USA kind of outfit where everything says USA and, you know, walk there essentially it was cool it was good yeah. and so the the athletes at the end would you say there's because i can only imagine that you have some athletes especially if it's their first time they're so wired about what they're doing that they're probably not able to take in the experience i know you know michael phelps had talked about that in some of his successive olympic games that he could really appreciate things more as he was you know competitive 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 and then as he's like man i'm going for it but I got to enjoy this because I know this is probably my last go around. Have you noticed that at the, by the end, the stress, the steam is off and, and they act in, in a little bit different way? Yeah, everyone's different because, you know, in my eyes, some of the most intense competition is to get into the Olympics. So I went to World Cup four in, in, in Calgary, Canada in December with speed skating. I remember um, years ago with other games, um, just the teams having to qualify was a big deal. You qualify your country and then your distance and then the athletes at Olympic trials. Those are really stressful. And then you get to the games. And in reality, I think only so many people have an excellent chance of winning medals. So those people that don't can enjoy it a little more, try and your best. Do they best. know that? Do they, I think they, they have they do. that, yeah, that yeah. mentality? Yeah, like, look, I, I'm such a dark horse in this. I got nothing to lose and everything just to go have fun. Yeah, with. I think athletes could answer that better. But um, I think you can see people more relaxed because they're, it is somewhat of a long shot, but athletes are there to compete. If you're ranked 10th, you still have a chance, you know, if yes. you show up and they don't. Yeah. And, well, and, look um, what happened in skating this year with the young Russian girl, like, 
Well, I'd never seen anything like that with what she did in those open that opening deal, mm-hmm. and then for her to fall twice and you know that whole thing. You never know what can happen sometimes. Well, and you know she was under a lot of stress, a ton of pressure. So, and in in you know they're there for a reason. They can handle the stress. I, not that athlete. You know, yes. there's a reason I'm not competing. Like you're they, treating. Uh, yeah, I think I'm <laughs> athletic, but I'm there to support them. Um, they handle stress well, but you're right. People, uh, things happen. And in short track speed skating, which were the two Olympics that I went to, um, they're racing. It's NASCAR in a hockey rink. It doesn't matter what the time is. It yes. matters who finishes first. There it can be go. the slowest like race as long as you finish first. So yeah. people fall, people slip, people get disqualified. Where long track speed skating is a time trial. Mostly right. they, they have some events where you're in a mass group, a mass start. Um, but anything can happen. Look at skiing, you know, people can fall and just yes. not have, it's not their day. Right. And, um, you can, you know, there's a, there's a famous race in Salt Lake where I believe he's Australian or, um, New Zealander. He was in last, but he kept getting moved up and he got in the final and everyone wiped out and he just came right across. I think it's Bradbury. He comes across in gold and he's, you know, he's a good skater, but, yeah. uh, he wasn't the gold medal favorite. And, um, that happens everywhere. You know, wow. so you see people perform and whether it's an American winning or another country, it is a community where like, if they beat us or they outperform, we can still be happy for them. And, right. and it's nice to see people perform because you ask, what is it like? It's neat being on like the edge of the pads, like in short track, for instance, and watching them fly around the, around the ice and being within 10 feet from them. And that's wow. like the only time I hold my breath, you know, it's just, and it's about, say it's a minute race or a minute, whatever. I can't breathe the whole time. Oh and, man. And then you go to like a longer distance, like long track and they try to control everything they can. It's a time and see them actually execute. You know, it's like, it's really interesting mental and physical challenge. And it's so impressive and, you know, but someone can come out ice conditions, weather, sleep, you walk to opening ceremonies and now your legs are toasted, you know, those yeah. things are very real. So, um, wow. yeah, it's, it's pretty neat. What yeah. about Apollo Ono? Did he, he was like the greatest that we've had, right? Our, our short track guy. Short track, yeah. He, he's won the most medals of a U.S. winter Olympian. Mm-hmm. Um, I was with him in Vancouver. I was going to ask if you was, had a chance yeah, to visit with him. He is and, who he was before I was there. And, you know, he, uh, I got to watch him, uh, race and, um, and work with them for about five months before the games, I think. And, um, you know, he's a friend, he's a good guy, but, uh, yeah, very impressive. Someone committed to their craft. I believe he was 27 or 30 pounds lighter his last Olympics than he was his first. The sport changed, got so lighter. So was that muscle? Was that mean he had to dump muscle? Cause there's, those guys can't carry much body fat. Like how did he, um, the, 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 the style changed the the i believe the sport got faster so he had to lose muscle mass yeah if that's the right answer um he had to change his body he wow. couldn't be as heavy and in his style served him well but uh the sport from what he's said you know the sport changed and and he changed with it and he so he essentially competed really well at a high level at different kind of stages in the sport's development that's in, that's phenomenal it's yeah. almost like a a fighter that fights at different weights or wrestler that wrestles at different weights. When you, when you look at it from that context, right? Like I'd never thought about that. Well, and that's the deep stuff. So when you look at physiology, how well do you understand physiology? It's not that we have no everything, but we have good, I good understanding and we have good concepts, but you're working with someone, him, for instance, who's has a goal and he has experience and he has a lot of control over his nutrition and his sleep and his healing and what he wants done. I mean, you're trying to compliment where then you say you have a younger athlete who doesn't have as much experience and as much as I'd like them to not eat crap, junk food, if they skip a meal, that could be one of the worst things for them. Yes. And we're on the road in Russia or something. And it's like, you know, there's a McDonald's right there. You haven't eaten in five hours, like, and you're sore and you have, you know, like this yeah. might be good to go over there like it's you have to deal with certain realities right it's not all clear cut just like an athlete we talk about balance and say chiropractic or sports med you have an athlete that turns left 
they're not going to be balanced. They shouldn't be fully balanced. Our best technical skaters um, were somewhat dysfunctional. We did functional screens on them. And it was yes. like the kids with the best technique often weren't the most balanced. But then you have people come in and like, oh, we got to balance them. It's like, ah, uh, you have to think outside the box. So Right. Treat so, that athlete as you find them. Yeah, it's not so much answers. It's just where are they now and try to meet them where they are. And I think most people do that with patience. And whether it's a high-level athlete or anyone, mm -hmm. it's, it's doable. But um, it's neat to do it with them because athletes respond well. You know, they're aging quickly, even though they're young, they're a young body, they have a lot of miles on them and you have to kind of be really artistic complementing their physiology. Ooh, that's good. You know? Yeah. What, what have you seen lessons? Have you learned from working with all these athletes with respect to, um, things that we could learn that I could, that I could take from the way those athletes look at life, the way they train their discipline. Is there any lessons that you've taken away from them? Because you've gotten to see so many across such a wide um, continuum. Yeah. Anything that sticks out like, man, the majority of great athletes think like this, do this, that we could take away as learning lessons. Yeah. I think they, um, they determine what they want and then they commit to the process and you'll see whether it's people in the gym want, I want to gain weight or strength or size. And it's like, it's not going to be, if you try to do that in three months, you're going to blow your body up. There's a process that's, and you need to have good sources of information. But the thing you see with an elite athlete is that commitment. They go through a lot of struggle because it doesn't always feel comfortable, but they're committed to the process. And a lot of people, whether it's life or professions, just are kind of change a lot and move a lot and don't give it time. But um, that's probably the best thing I've noticed. I mean, they're just committed and, um, but they listen and they get feedback. They good, good. They're need, coachable. Sure. Sure. Yeah. But what about when they experience adversity? Have you noticed, obviously all of us react differently to adversity, but I can't imagine that anyone that has gotten to that level hasn't had an injury, suffered from overtraining, had some sort of setback that it's not a, a progressive arc all the way up to success for these cats. Have you noticed any mental um, attributes that they have when it comes to adversity? They're not soft. I mean, I mean, we, we, we did a podcast on mental health and talking about like sports, like medalists and like what they go through, how traumatic it can be. And there's a, whether it's a mental health crisis or people being aware of their struggles, um, elite athletes are very, fairly stable, but they have a, a support system. Usually it's parents or coaches or trainers that are with them, like being advocates, they can't do it alone. So like the average person, if you are under stress and you have a demand that's you might break down and that's a normal response to abnormal stress. You, you need a team around you, whether it's a professional team or family, you can't just do it yourself. So athletes have a team around them. The staff is important, but the athletes, the most important, but you have a lot of people watching, complimenting them, not telling them nice things, but giving them things they need, being honest. And to the average person, what I've learned is just, if, if you have questions about what you're going through, there's, you should ask people you trust for feedback. You may not accept it. You may not like it, but, um, that's something they can take because they're trying to, most of us are trying to perform at a level we've never done, whether it's professional or business or sport, there's lessons to be learned from them. That's incredible. Yeah. What about mentorship? So they're coachable. Do many of them have mentors that they seek out for help in times of, of, whatever, right? Whether they report to them to learn new techniques because you've got coaches and maybe coaches are mentors at that level. I don't know, but I just see outside of that elite athlete world, if someone knows that they have a go-to person as a mentor that they can ask the tough questions to, that they can share them the real selves, you know, forget the persona. Is there, is it like that in athletes or do those guys and gals have this thing of like, Look, you, I, I can't show you my soft side because I got to be hard so that I can win. No, they have mentors. Often it's family or an ex, you know, their first coach or someone from their past and present. Um, obviously their partner, if they have like a boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife. But um, at that level, just like when you deal with like collegiate sports, you have like basketball, for instance, these kids come out, they're coachable. But once they reach the NBA, the coaches are managing personalities more. So 
coaches at a really high level in Olympic sport, often it's not that they have to manage a bad personality. It's just this athlete is at a really high level. So they have to tweak and modify and plan and looking for results now by, but also planning for the future. It's a hard task. It's very stressful. So whether it's a coach or a trainer or an athlete, athletes definitely have people that mentors that often are from, I think from their past who they reach out to. You'll see a lot of kids that compete at that level. Their parents are often very active or athletes themselves, or they've had a mentor who got them into the sport, you know, who they met. And, um, but there are a lot of other ex, there are ex athletes that are pretty, um, involved in the community. Most, most coaches are, well, all the coaches in speed skating seem to be ex speed skaters. Logically, they might not be the head coach of you now, but they've, they do training on the side and, um, you know, in a lot of the programs, the head coach of the national governing team, the body isn't necessarily your head coach. So I don't know if that answers your question, but yeah, they, they have mentors. Um, but a lot of them are going to go on and get degrees in sports science. Sports psychology is really important. Sport, having sports psychologists on the team is essential at this point because they're not soft, but they need help. I was going to ask that. Yeah. That was my next question. Interestingly enough, when I see the likes of Michael Phelps making mental health his big pillar that he wants to try to promote, when I see Simone Biles go through what she went through and you know the twisties, which I had never heard of, yeah. all of a sudden becoming a, a stress, it's because of predominantly stress, not necessarily just a physiological imbalance causing her to get twisted up in the air. You see Michaela Schifrin just in this most recent, after that first time down, she was so un, not used to it with the pressure and her dad and all the rest of it, it just seemed to, to pile on. And, and it made me think what mental pressure these folks are under seems like that would be a necessary part of the team. And, and I am such a big fan, like we have family and law enforcement in my family, and I've done several of the shows with, with law enforcement type folks on here. And the connection between performance and mental health and knowing you have an outlet to share those thoughts and feelings before it gets to that point seems important for all of us, regardless of what we do. But is that a standard go-to that the athletes that they all get some sort of support in that way or only if things start going wrong? No. Yeah. There's usually a sports psychologist associated with the team. And, and is it something that, though that they, people have to seek out or no, do they It's no, mental it's health. So it. you can't be told what to do, but I think they do have interaction with them. And like when we're at the games or on world cup, uh, you, they would often just be around the team hovering because stuff happens. You get knocked out and, Maybe you don't need a lot of help, but you have someone there and their job is to be supportive for you and hold space for you. You know, a lot of us just need a little help. Yes. <laughs> it feels overwhelming. And whether it's people coming out of a penitentiary or changing careers, like an athlete getting into the real world now, or um, law enforcement with certain trauma that they'll experience, like they, they need someone to ask how they're doing it. Not necessarily it's always a deep dive. Mm -hmm. Um, because if you're trying to get performance out of an athlete, um, there's time, you can't break them down too much, like acutely, but bigger picture, if they need the services, it's there for them as much as, um, more would be better in my experience of all the teams, especially at the games, the team USA, us Olympic committee and speed skating in particular has had sports psychologists around. You know, so there's no question. I still see that some of the sports psychologists that work with them traveling with Paralympic and they know that person is likely always available for them, but the, the system and the program has it for them. That's so, so cool. it's exciting. Yeah. But then, you know, the, the big question now moving forward is like coaches and staff, the athletes, the most important, but like, you know, how a human is when you deal with stress, they, you might project your fears and your stress on your kids or your, your wife or whoever your athlete. So it's neat to see where it's, it, we're just not acting like it's only the athlete. It's actually the whole team, you know, so everyone's, everyone has to be dialed in as much as possible, but really just self-aware, like what their role is on the team, supporting this athlete, trying to reach goals that are incredibly difficult. So in my experience, all the coaches I've worked with, I've had great relationships and 
it's generally been really positive. That's so great. Yeah. Well, you know, now kind of turning the page from your Olympic experience, I think that was great. I was really excited to learn and hear and be part of that and feel like I could gain what it was like to be in an Olympics through you. And I think you did a sure. great job of that. Now you currently you work with your team up in Lafayette and you guys are seeing all kinds of different kinds of cases including some trauma. Like I know we work together on cases of people that have been injured in a car wreck or some sort of personal injury. How is it different treating injuries caused by trauma that is not sport specific with respect to when, when someone has been, let's just say they, I don't know, let's just say they get rear ended and their neck whips back and they got neck pain and headaches. Is that a different mindset for you as a provider or for them as a patient than what you see from an athlete? Yeah, I think there is a difference in physiology, but it's not that big of a difference. If you're into helping people, I could care less if it's an athlete or not. I just, you know, they have a job. They sit at a desk or they work in some, whatever their employment is. They were tight before. What's your activity level before? How into movement and exercise or taking care of yourself are you? We're evaluating them just the same way we would an athlete and trying to meet them where their needs are. Now, just like an athlete, there's certain circumstances we have to honor, performance, training, uh, a case, an accident case, um, you know, whether it's like availability, work schedule, um, litigation, like we just were aware of things. We have to just understand their circumstance and meet them where they are. But in terms of physiology, trauma is trauma to me. And in the in the Boulder area or Denver area, people are generally active. But mm. the thing about an accident is people generally don't want to be hurt. They didn't want to be hurt. They want to get back to feeling normal. So it's a unique situation where the person is motivated to get better. And our team is a reflection of what I experienced with an Olympic model. I like, I don't have all the answers. I think I can serve most people incredibly well, but part of that is saying, I don't think I am the person for you. You should see them. So having full medical injections if needed and medical management and diagnostics on site on our campus with concussion team, cognitive therapy, vestibular therapy, physical therapy, massage, Cairo. We work in one unit and the unique thing about a car accident in our facility, even though that's not most of our patients, is that's one of those in, um, those times where we actually use a lot of the team on cases. And we meet once a month to talk over those cases where, that we're collaborating with each other. And um, it's pretty neat. My value is probably the least important. I'm a glue guy for those cases. And when you deal with elite athletes, it's not about me. I might have more responsibility with an elite athlete, but their coach and their strength and conditioning coach, but their head skating coach, um, it's remarkably similar in terms of the energy. Because if, if, if we need help, ask for it and do what's right for them. Um, but when you're dealing with someone, say a lower level athletic level, if you can't figure it out with them, you probably means you're not listening. You're not really into it. We are, we're motivated to help anyone. And um, our, our facility is built in an Olympic type model of having a collective team, but it fits a lot of different needs in a, a car accident case, for instance, is just perfect for us. Right. It's cool because, and what I've always seen is when I was treating patients, whether they be athletes or people that suffered micro traumas from repetitive use sure. syndromes or macro traumas like a car wreck, I could still use a lot of my same tools, right? I know that I've got to restore range of motion. I know that I've got to try to decrease swelling and inflammation. I know I got to make sure that biomechanically they're solid so that they can have good movement patterns. And it was the same tools. And so to be able to, for people to know that no matter what's going on, you can get the same kind of treatment as an Olympic level athlete. It's the same toys, the same tricks, the same knowledge strategies. That's amazing. It's all, yeah, the techniques are the same. It's just applied maybe a little differently. Right. But a lot of times the process is very similar. That's so Figure cool. out what you're trying to treat diagnostic wise and then apply a, a healing strategy, see how you respond. But yeah, we, it's, it's, it's very similar. We enjoy it. And you're dealing with people who often like a, a concussion with a head and neck injury with a job and a life and kids. It's pretty neat when you deal with someone who has three kids, a single mom, 
who's really hurt, you, you're probably getting the best version of me where I just want you to feel better. Yes. I'm willing, I'll be here for you. And if, if we have the team that can support you. So as much as I like elite sport, it, it doesn't define me. Um, I just want to help people and yeah, it doesn't matter. It's so good. You know, I think as we kind of wrap this up that people should know, and this is what I would always tell my patients. I said, look, I've treated a lot of elite athletes, but you're elite at what you do. We need to treat you because you're the breadwinner. You're the mom making sure everyone's getting everything done. You've, you're a student that your job is your education. You're as important to your team as a pro football player or an Olympic athlete is to their team. And so we would always look at that like, I want to give you everything to get you to that level that you're hitting your peak. So whether they're injured or not, that's where, you know, maintenance type care comes in and advice and just working with them. And to know that you guys do that is exciting. Um, would you, first of all, what's your podcast about? Because tell people where, where they can listen to you, what your podcast is about. And if they want to, you know, listen yeah. to that, I'd like them to be able to find it. We have a few businesses doc personal injuries for car accident cases and, and our comprehensive team. But our my main practice is ESP sports medicine. It's within the same facility, comprises the same people. But um, the podcast on YouTube, um, it's primarily a video podcast right now, but it's uh, it's ESP sports medicine. It's a life and injury or life and health clinic. And, you know, we, we just work with the average person, whether you're active or an athlete. And yeah, we're interviewing people in sports science, sports technology, sports medicine. It's often a bunch of my friends at this point, but we've had, um, you know, medalists and talking about whether it's mental health or injury and how they experienced it. I love it. Yeah. And if people wanted to learn more and get a hold of you, what would they do? How would they reach out to you? Uh, the easiest way is probably espsportsmedicine.com. It's our website. Um, we're very accessible in terms of, uh, email and phone calls. And we do a lot of like free little consultations. Cause if there, there are people out there who don't know where to go, they've tried everything. You can get some time, 15, 20 minutes with us and just to at least talk. So brain power is really valued at this point. And with whether it's zoom or telehealth, like there's no reason why we can't help more people. And, um, we're just looking to help our community or community based clinic. And we're in North Denver, Lafayette, Boulder area, and, um, not too far away to, to feel better and find the people you need. So cool. Yeah. Final question for you. If you had one piece of advice that you've learned along the way that someone gave you or that you picked up on your own that you feel is absolutely paramount and critical to how you live a life well lived, what would that piece of advice be that we could all take away from this, uh, this episode? Hmm. Well, I got hurt pretty bad at 17. So most of the patients I work with are middle-aged, aging athletes, aging people. So I've had to manage my activity level and learn that I have so many miles on my body already at 60, 70, 80 and older. I want to be able to do what I want to do. And having managed elite athletes and the average person is, you know, your body's going to change as you age. And if you keep doing the same thing, it's likely an abnormal stress that your body won't withstand very well. So you need to listen to your body. And part of that is interacting with reputable people that can give you feedback about, Hey, why don't you try this, try that and be open to trying, whether it's nutrition or different movements or sports or activities, because the feedback we get from treating people or introducing new activities or movement, we learn a lot more by listening to what happens than just making assumptions. Your body will speak to you. So just don't be afraid to um, use your body in different ways, your brain in different ways, and you'd be surprised you could actually master a lot of the wellness and healing principles that you'll need to be active later in life because I think we're going to have a long life ahead of us and there's going to be a bump in life expectancy. So the biggest lesson being injured was I can't do the same things I did in at 20-something, but that's okay because I'm probably going to be able to like last longer. So it was a blessing. I love that, man. That was such wisdom. I hope everybody listening enjoyed the show, enjoyed that experience, that Olympic moment that I got to experience as well with Dr. St. Pierre. If you want to uh, share this, please do send it to your family, friends, other people that might be into health, wellness, longevity, elite sports, whatever, send that. Make sure you go to Dr. St. Pierre's podcast, listen to that at the ESP Sports Science. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me, Dr. Jim Hoven at ramoslaw.com. Until next time, be well and get out there and make a difference.